the sum of their parts, written by Hold My Beer. Chapter 4. Thursday morning arrived with the heavy pressure of an impending thunderstorm. When will the ministry act? The prophet demanded, conveniently not mentioning that they themselves were unable to pay their people too. The entire front page was a thinly veiled demand that someone put those miserable creatures in their place, and the pro-goblin letters had been delegated to somewhere between the weekly wizard wanderer, this time detailing a disastrous visit to a muggle pub, and a mostly incoherent rant about the current prices of potions ingredients. The Ministry apparently expected a large number of angry wizards and witches to descend upon the atrium and warned them on the second page of the Prophet to stay home, as showing up would do nothing to help. Harry wasn't surprised, and he wasn't stupid enough to even consider going anywhere outside of Grimmauld's wards. Ron and Hermione arrived shortly before noon with a basket from Mrs Weasley. Both looked somewhat grim. Dad's staying home today. He says his job isn't worth his life. Mum's happy. Mr. Weasley, Harry knew, was in a position where he could do just that and where he had a good chance of a new job if he did get fired for it. Far from everyone in the wizarding world could claim the same. Harry was still grateful that the kind man was out of harm's way, should everything blow up today. What about George? Ron's grim expression tightened. In Diagon, he's not leaving the shop. There wasn't much Harry could say to that. And so he didn't. They spent the afternoon in the library, eating huge slices of Mrs. Weasley's exceptional Victoria sponge cake, and generally not doing much of anything. Harry couldn't focus, and judging by Hermione's fidgeting and Ron's restless shifting, he wasn't alone. It's weird not being in the middle of it, Ron finally said when the silence became too much. We've always been at the centre of everything, whether we wanted it or not, and now we're just waiting. It might not happen today, Harry pointed out, though he knew it was a lie as soon as he said it. If they wait much longer, the ministry will get toppled. Hermione didn't look happy. None of them did. They didn't like the goblins, but they didn't have much better experiences with the ministry either. It didn't mean they wanted that inevitable bloodbath to happen when the ministry finally stepped in. They have to act. People are out of money. Even with support from some of the lesser banks, they're out of time. I don't get it, Ron looked bothered. I. It makes no sense. The goblins, I mean. They must have known it wouldn't work. Harry poked the last bite of cake with his fork. Stubbornness? he wondered. And it's goblins, I guess. Maybe they thought the Ministry was weak and would cave to avoid another war. Not all of the goblin rebellions had sensible reasons behind them, Hermione said, searching for a nice word. It could be that history was written by the victors, but sometimes they went to war over the slightest of reasons, and most times they fought the wizarding world to a standstill at the very least. Harry took her word for it. He hadn't paid much attention in history of magic as it was, as his grades could attest to. Confidence? Ron considered that. Well, I reckon that's as good of a reason as any. None of them mentioned the number of people likely to be in Diagon Alley, despite the tense situation. George was there too, and Lee and Angelina and whoever else was manning the shop, but at least they could protect themselves. The shop was as close to a fortress as it could get while still keeping up the appearance of a joke shop. Few others were likely to be anywhere near as prepared. Harry, Ron and Hermione had all been forced to learn a number of painful lessons over the years, and one of them was that you had to pick your battles. Harry would have blamed himself once. He still felt unreasonably guilty about a situation he had nothing to do with and could do nothing to change, but he was getting better. Ron and Hermione ensured that. The room fell silent again. Hermione made an effort to at least try to focus on a book, but both Harry and Ron merely sat there, staring into empty air. A whisper of magic was all the warning they got before the room lit up in bright silver from George's Patronus. Auras and ministry people showed up outside a couple of minutes ago. They vanished by portkey or apparition. Pretty sure I saw some unspeakables, too. We just started to hear fighting from Gringotts. Message delivered, the spell faded and left the room a lot darker. Hermione stared the spot where the Patronus had been. 
It's going to be a slaughter. With that sort of fighting, both sides are going to be bleeding people, Ron agreed. Bleeding people for utterly pointless reasons. Because few beings could hold a grudge like a goblin. Because the Ministry had a centuries-long history of oppression and discrimination. Because every goblin rebellion left the two sides with more resentment towards each other. And Harry knew better than to believe that would ever go away. He raised his wand and focused on happy memories and the feeling of his own Patronus. A moment later, Prongs pranced into existence. If it comes to it, Grimold is open. I know it's the shop, but worst case, it can still be rebuilt. We can't lose anyone else, he didn't say. Not you, too. If not for us, then for your mum. They waited in silence. Then, a long minute later, George's Patronus reappeared. They'd have better luck breaking into the Ministry than these wards. We made them to keep Death Eaters out, more than the bloody Ministry ever managed. The best they could hope for, Harry supposed, George would never leave the shop to burn. I wish... I hate not doing something. Ron's frustration spoke for all three of them. We spent so long wondering why it always had to be us, why no one else did a thing. I don't want us to be in the middle of that thing, but now I wish we could do something. Trained us well, didn't they? He added bitterly. None of our business any more now in it, but we're still here wanting to help. Harry's answering smile was tired and every bit as bitter. Not like anyone else will do much, is it? They'll wreck the alley, probably. Gringotts will be a tomb. Themselves and the goblins both. Goblins know the place and have the numbers, but we've got wands and auras with a grudge from the war. Probably pretty evenly matched, I'd say. Hermione gripped Harry's hand blindly, and he knew without reaching for the bond that it was time to end that line of conversation. Ron wrapped his arm around Hermione's waist, and Hermione's fingers entwined with Harry's, and they simply stayed there for long minutes until Hermione made a soft sound and broke the silence. <coughs> They're never going to stop. Harry didn't ask if she meant the Ministry or the Goblins. The answer was the same anyway. Ron grimaced. Letting the Goblins win even once would have been suicide, and Goblins never forget a loss. They'll get even. Doesn't matter if they have to wait a century to do it. They hate the Ministry. They have to work with them, but they hate it. Bill told me he almost didn't get hired at first because Dad is a Ministry employee. They only changed their mind because, well, we're pretty sorry excuses for pure bloods. He glanced at Harry. The only person they'd be less happy to deal with would probably be Harry. Which probably meant that when he was done forcibly fixing the wizarding world, he would have a goblin rebellion to deal with instead. Maybe even both at the same time, if they saw their chance while he was busy elsewhere. Hermione was quiet for a long time. I thought if we could fix society, we could fix the ministry, and maybe then things would be better, she confessed. We'd fix the discrimination and the pure blood-centric laws, and I supposed I thought that would be it, but it won't be. There will always be someone be something that won't be happy. I knew the wizarding world wouldn't approve, but... You thought the magical beings at least would appreciate what we had done, Harry finished quietly. Ron cleared his throat. Most of them would be, I think. Goblins are just different, I guess. The werewolves and vampires and those kinds, I think they'd appreciate it. Just goblins, I guess, he said again with an awkward shrug. Harry had accepted that he would live the rest of his life at war the moment he had told Hermione and Ron his plans. He had hoped for a while, allowed himself to wonder what it would be like to have a family and a home and a steady job somewhere that wasn't trying to kill him. He had also accepted that it would never happen. He would always be the man who won, and that would always make him a target. Now he was just a target for something he had actively chosen. Harry had accepted it. Hermione, he realised, hadn't until now, and it hurt more than he thought it would to see her struggle with it. With a glance at Ron, they both moved closer, holding Hermione tight as they simply waited in silence for news to arrive. The Goblin Rebellion of 1999 ended on April Fool's Day with an uneasy truce after six days. The terms were not hashed out until late that evening, and both sides paid for it in blood. It was not a long goblin rebellion, but it had caused plenty of damage still. Harry saw the list of those injured or killed in the Prophet the following morning, 
and was grateful he didn't recognize a single name. They didn't name the goblins, of course. All they mentioned in that regard was a throwaway sentence of a as well as seventy-six goblins of Gringotts. Considering that it was the prophet, Harry was impressed they mentioned even that much. Luna appeared on the doorstep of Grimold that Saturday, but it wasn't the Luna that Harry remembered. Her robes were sunshine yellow, but the pattern almost subdued, and her earrings were small and metallic and blandly traditional. Her large, silvery eyes focused on the air somewhere above Harry's right ear, but then she seemed to force herself to look him in the eye. Harry let her inside, concern growing by the second. Luna! Harry! She made an awkward curtsy. Harry took her hand gently. Luna, we're still your friends. Please! At the top of the staircase, Hermione and Ron appeared, drawn by the worry in their bond. Luna! Hermione took a step down the stairs, looking as worried as Harry felt. He felt Luna's hand tremble. She made a soft sound, and then she collapsed in Harry's arms, sobbing brokenly as Harry held her helplessly. My father is encouraging a relationship with Rolf Scamander, Luna whispered half an hour later when they had managed to calm her down enough to speak again. She had a mug of hot chocolate in her hands and a conjured handkerchief courtesy of Ron. She looked better, but her eyes were still ringed with red. Hermione frowned slightly as she tried to pinpoint the name. From Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. His grandson, Luna hesitated. He is a very accomplished naturalist. Something in her voice made Harry's heart twist painfully. Ron's frown left no doubt he had picked up on it too. I don't recall his name from Hogwarts. How old is he? Hermione asked carefully. Luna looked down at her mug, a far cry from the somewhat strange but surprisingly blunt girl they had known at school. He will be thirty this year. He was a Ravenclaw. He's a very kind man, and he will be a loving husband. It sounded like she was dutifully reciting a line she had heard a dozen times before. He's almost twice your age. That isn't right, Luna. Hermione's house-elf crusade might have died a quiet death but her stubborn refusal to accept the unfairness of the wizarding world hadn't. You don't have to marry someone just because your father wants you to. Luna's hand trembled. Hermione reached out to cover it with her own, and the younger girl calmed a little again. The Scamander family is well-to-do, and we are not, she admitted softly but brutally honest. Father is old-fashioned. He wants to find me a husband that will be able to proper care for me, and very few proper purebloods want to marry loony lovegood. Rolf is far better than being broodmare to a man four times my age. What about the quibbler? Harry asked. Father barely makes enough to support himself. He can't afford to have me stay at home for much longer. My grandmother had put aside gold for my Hogwarts supplies. I would not have been able to attend otherwise. She hesitated again, and Hermione squeezed her hand a little tighter in silent support. I can't stay. Father is. He was never well after Mother died. There is no job that would pay enough to support me on my own right out of Hogwarts. Nobody wants to hire Looney when there are dozens of other normal, sensible, clever Ravenclaws around with better grades applying for the good jobs. Rolf is a kind person, she repeated, no less unconvincing. I am very fortunate. The three of them exchanged a glance as Luna focused on her mug again. Even half a year ago, the ministry would have been an option. Harry didn't want to be the sort of person that relied on his fame for everything, but for Luna, he would gladly have pulled what strings he could to get her a ministry job. That approach had been firmly closed after Shacklebolt's visit. I've got the emotional range of a teaspoon, Ron reminded them. Don't ask me. Hermione rolled her eyes and looked pointedly at Harry. He sighed soundlessly and tried to figure out what to say. This wasn't the Luna they were used to. This wasn't the Luna who randomly showed up and talked about strange creatures that... Does he believe in nargles and raxperts? Harry asked, grasping onto that thought. Will he hunt crumple-horned snorkax with you? Luna stayed silent, staring at her mug. That was all the answer Harry needed. Grimold wasn't a particular nice place, but there were rooms to spare, and most of them were even suitable for humans these days. It might be awkward with their plans and research if Luna lived with them, but Harry trusted her to keep a secret. He just needed his two friends' agreement. Grimold, 
He began, but was interrupted by Ron. The burrow, he blurted. Bloody hell, can't believe I forgot about that. Just give me a moment. Ron left the room in a half run, throwing a distracted gesture of stay in their direction. Luna looked up, confusion in her huge eyes. Hermione shrugged a little in a silent, your guess is as good as mine. They could have asked him, but Harry figured they would know soon enough. They stayed in uncomfortable silence until Ron's footsteps returned at a more sensible pace, followed by another set. Harry looked up to see Ron step inside, followed by Mrs. Weasley. Harry wasn't sure how much Ron had shared, but judging from the worried expression and slight frown, he assumed it had been enough. Oh, you poor dear, Mrs. Weasley said down next to Luna and tugged a stray lock of blonde hair back behind her ear. It'll be all right, just you see. Luna trembled, and a moment later she was clinging to Mrs. Weasley, sobbing again as she let go of the pain and stress and fear. Hermione slipped soundlessly out the door, Ron and Harry on her heels. They closed the door quietly behind them and let the two have some privacy. Mum, we have lots of room in the burrow now that most of us have moved out. And Mum, Mum's not good with being in a quiet house, Ron said. Luna will have a place to stay and someone to support her, and Mum will have a little more life in the house. It wasn't a perfect solution, maybe, but Harry was rapidly realising that very little in the wizarding world was. Hogwarts classes started up again Monday the 12th of April. The Hogwarts Express had departed the day before under heavy security, taking with it all of the students, and life beyond Hogwarts settled down once more. That Monday also became the day when Harry received the visit he'd been expecting for a while. The wards alerted him to visitors shortly before eight that morning. He had already been up for a good few hours by then, woken up by nightmares like so often before, so at least he was dressed and had already finished breakfast when someone knocked loudly on the front door. Mute appeared by his side, her eyes wide and terrified, and Harry knew there and then just exactly what sort of visitors he had. Mute was a timid creature, afraid of most things. But Harry had discovered that few things terrified her as much as auras. He suspected it had been part of the training the Lestranges had given her, and that wasn't something he wanted to linger on. Harry put aside the charms book he had been reading and made his way to the door with forced calmness. Everything illegal, everything even overly questionable, had been hidden in the basement under the Fidelius. It still didn't stop him from feeling like he was about to face an enemy in battle. He opened the bond to Ron and Hermione with a thought and felt the comforting warmth of their presence. The sight that greeted him when he opened the door was six auras in those familiar red uniforms. The one in front wore the rank of captain and had a formal-looking piece of parchment in his hand. Mute wrung her hands but vanished to somewhere else without Harry needing to tell her. He had given her strict instructions never to interfere with Aura business unless he specifically told her to. The potential punishment, if she attacked one of them, even in defence of him, was not something he was willing to risk on her. Be careful, mate, Ron said. Dad says they've been a lot rougher lately since the goblins and all. Uh, Harry James Potter, the captain spoke. By order of the Ministry, we have a warrant to search for dark artefacts on the premises. He held out the warrant. Harry accepted it and remained silent as he read through it carefully. He was used to legal documents now, and he wanted to make sure everything was in order. Several of the auras shifted uneasily, though Harry couldn't tell if it was because of who he was or the reason for the warrant. He let the silence stretch a few seconds longer just to add to the discomfort. I believe we got rid of all of it, he finally said airily, but it is the Black family home. Perform your search, Captain, but I will be watching the proceedings. There will be no one left to wander alone in my home. The Captain frowned. It will be faster if we split up, sir. This is just a formality. Of course, Harry agreed. Unfortunately, I have had a number of unpleasant experiences with the Ministry in the past seven years. You will forgive me for being less than trusting. One of the Auras stepped forward and spoke something hurriedly in a low voice that Harry couldn't hear. The captain's face soured a little. Understandable, sir. We can work around it. Harry nodded and gestured to the door leading further into the house. Then after you, Captain. Shacklebolt. Hermione's anger and betrayal flowed clear through their bond. 
Probably, Harry agreed with surprisingly little bitterness, most of his attention on the auras. Or someone else has it out for us. But you'd probably need to go pretty high up in the system to get a warrant to search the home of the Slayer of Voldemort. The auras started with the hallway and brought out a number of instruments, half of which Harry didn't even recognize. Detectors. Dark magic detection spells are useless in the older manners, with so many years of dark arts in them, Hermione said quietly. You never mentioned to anyone that you finished clearing out the house. As far as Shacklebolt knows, Grimold is still full of dark artifacts from the Black family. The betrayal echoed in Harry's bond now, too, sharp and bitter. Ron. Couple of reasons I can think of, their third answered. Only two that really make sense, I figure. One, he's hoping to give you a good scare, use it to make you fall more in line with the Ministry. I'm sure he's got a speech all picked out for when he calls you to his office and reassures you that he knows it's all a misunderstanding and he'll, of course, handle this for one of the great heroes of Hogwarts. Ron hesitated for a moment and Harry knew it wouldn't be good. Two, he's decided you're a threat and this is a genuine attempt to get you into trouble. This is what they did to suspected Death Eaters, too. Either way, the Ministry officially became a threat, Harry summarised. His two friends didn't answer. They didn't need to. The search took six gruelling hours and found nothing. Grim old place had been expanded far beyond its size, and the auras were thorough, leading Harry to suspect that they had expected to find something. The Fidelius held. They didn't find the basement. Man who won's home raided by auras, Dark Lord Rising? It wasn't Rita Skeeter's name on the article, but Harry recognised the style of the words anyway. I suppose it was too much to hope for that she wouldn't try to find a way around it, Hermione said resignedly. She hesitated for a moment, mainly because she was reluctant to give up blackmail material as useful as that. None of them had any pity for Rita Skeeter, and then she sighed. I'll send an anonymous tip to the DMLE. Rita Skeeter was arrested two days later. An unregistered animagus with no prior record and a useless form could, with some luck, end up find a significant amount of galleons but avoid prison. Rita Skeeter, who had stepped on some very influential toes and had an animagus form that lent itself exceptionally well to gathering information no one wanted shared, faced the full wizengamot. That it happened in the wake of a goblin rebellion only made the punishment all the harsher. She tried to take a number of people down with her, chiefly Hermione for blackmail. Without Veritas Serum, and with no witnesses beyond Ron and Harry, who would both gladly and willingly lie to the entire wizarding world for Hermione's safety, there were few people willing to listen to her, and even fewer willing to believe that the war heroine Bookworm was even capable of such a thing. The Prophet's editor-in-chief earned a steep fine. Rita Skeeter earned two years in Azkaban. In Grimold Place, three glasses of fire whiskey clinked together in a silent toast. Ron and Hermione moved to Grimold Place the last weekend of April. Molly Weasley wasn't altogether convinced about the whole thing, but she had also never liked Harry living alone there, and in the end she had relented. Crookshanks was a little displeased. He had enjoyed the broad expanses of open land around the burrow, according to Hermione, but even he eventually deigned to settle down on the couch by the fireplace. There wasn't much to move, and when they stood there with a few trunks worth of shrunken items, there was a moment of awkward silence. You can have any bedroom you want, Harry said. Alone or together, I... It's up to you. Mine's on the second floor. The master bedroom, Hermione confirmed. She glanced at Ron and seemed to reach some silent agreement. Good. It's big enough for all three of us. Harry blinked. What? No. Hermione stood straighter, daring him to argue. I'm tired of nightmares and I know Ron is too. We can transfigure a decent bed for tonight and find a proper sized one later that fits all three of us. We're miserable apart and to be crude, none of us are dating anyway. Give it one night, Harry. We already have a bond and have seen each other naked last year. Our nightmares are less when we're together. Give it one night to see if it's true when all three of us share a room, just sleeping, nothing more. There wasn't much he could say to that. And after the best sleep he'd had in months in a bed that took up half the room, there wasn't much he wanted to argue about the following morning anyway. They cracked the hurdle of Veritaserum in early May. 
It took a combination of their bond, crude occlumency, and a lot of practice on Harry's part. With Harry's experience to draw on, both Hermione and Ron would likely master it much faster, and with Hermione's well-organized mind, none of them doubted that she would have it down in no time. The familiar haze settled around Harry's mind one quiet Tuesday afternoon in Grimald, and Hermione's endless question reached across the distance to him. What is your name? Harry reached towards one side of the bond and blocked all other things from his mind until all he was, all he knew, was the familiar presence of his first friend. The whole thing took an instant and he spoke before he was entirely aware of it. Ronald Billius Weasley, something crashed to the floor. Somewhere along the bonds was a flare of surprise and excitement that came through even the effects of the Veritaserum. Hermione's voice when she spoke again was calm, barely. Have you cast the Fidelius? Harry blinked slowly. No, he said truthfully, because Ron Weasley had not. Are you male? That one was easy. Harry almost answered until the other side of the bond reached him and he was surrounded by the alien sense of knowledge, endless, meticulously organized knowledge, and he knew the answer then. No, he said equally truthfully, because Hermione Granger was not. Merlin, Ron's voice whispered in the distance. We did it. We bloody did it. Maybe, Hermione's voice said grimly. None of it was a question, though, so Harry did not answer. Who was the bonder of Harry Potter's unbreakable vow? Hermione asked for the fourth time, and this time there was no out. Both his bonds knew, just as Harry himself did, and if he hadn't been surrounded by the strange otherworldliness of the potion effects, he would have felt disappointment settle where elation had been a moment before. Ronald Billius Weasley, he spoke. He felt someone tilt his head back, and the familiar taste of the antidote filled his mouth a moment later. It's not lying, Hermione stated, but it is selectively choosing the truth. You looked just like any other time you've been under the potion. It felt like it. Harry accepted the glass of water from Ron and took a swallow to get the sour aftertaste of the antidote out. I couldn't fight it, but I could focus enough on one of you that I could speak the truth as you knew it. I felt the tug on the bond, Ron said. Focus on the part of the bond that we need and block out the rest. It should work, as long as there's always one of us that stays out of whatever it is. Only in those situations that might prove a problem, Hermione said. And we can take turns if we must. You had no problem switching between us, did you? Very little, Harry confirmed. And I think it'll get easier every time. Hermione nodded again then. And when we're sure you can do it in your sleep, you teach us in turn. With the end of the Hogwarts year quickly approaching, owls had flown between Neville and Hermione almost daily. Hermione knew the Hogwarts and Black Libraries, knew what they had and what they still needed and what exactly Neville could get his hands on, and she ran her book-hoarding mission like a military campaign. The Black Library was massive, but there were still a number of subjects either lacking in books or where the material was severely outdated. With access to Harry's accounts, Hermione had gone hunting to find what they needed. Some books they bought, some they borrowed and copied from the Hogwarts Library through Neville. The Wizarding World had a number of protections against copying, but those charms wore off after a number of years and generally weren't cast on much, if only because the spells to actually copy a book were devilishly difficult to cast. Hermione had mastered them with unsurprising ease, and she had proceeded to teach Harry as well. She had drilled him mercilessly in the spells until he finally managed to her demanding standards, and the only reason she hadn't made Ron learn too was because he was busy with healing spells instead. Hogwarts, Hermione had quickly discovered, did not have protections to stop someone from sending a book home. Pince only cared that the book was returned on time and in pristine shape. As a result, a number of shrunken books found their way to grim old place where they would be duplicated and sent back. The spells required parchment and ink to work with, as well as unwavering focus. Copying those books had, more than anything, taught Harry the focus he would need to pull off a number of other spells flawlessly. It took a solid week of practice in March before he had managed to create a copy that wasn't somehow flawed. By May, he had it down to ten minutes. 
Between the two of them, the holes in the Black Library were filling in fast. The Blacks had cared little for light magic, and Hogwarts had that in abundance. The Blacks had preferred subtle, insidious magic, while Neville found a number of books in Hogwarts that dealt with the sort of high-power magic that had been used during the final battle. Hermione had told Neville what they did and didn't have access to already, and Neville had provided. In return, they duplicated a number of the books for him as well. Some were hideously expensive. Some were the sort his grandmother refused to spend good, decent gold on herbology, for the most part. Even the limitations on books from the restricted section, which were not supposed to leave Hogwarts, were easily subverted between Hermione's knowledge of spells and Neville's permission slip from Professor Sprout. Between research, trying to be there for Andromeda and Teddy, leaning any useful spells he could get his hands on, brewing potions and duplicating books with Hermione, and the relentless Veritaserum sessions, Harry could count on one hand the number of nights he'd slept more than five hours since March. Ron and Hermione were doing little better, with the added work from the Foundation on top. They kept a permanent supply of invigoration drafts in the potions lab, and all three of them had learned to drink coffee out of bitter necessity. Neither option was particularly good for their mental focus, and the draft was a flat-out hazard, but they didn't have much of a choice. Anyone in Hogwarts they knew and could trust enough with any of their plans would graduate come June Neville, Ginny, Luna, and pretty much everyone else they had really come to know during their school years. By the middle of June, at the latest, the Hogwarts library would be permanently out of reach, and so they pushed on as time ticked down mercilessly. In the third week of June, the Hogwarts Express returned to King's Cross, and the students returned home to the summer holidays or their first steps into the wide world beyond Hogwarts. Harry had arrived with Ron, Hermione, Andromeda and Teddy to meet the rest of the Weasleys. Molly wanted the whole family there for Ginny's arrival, and none of them wanted to argue. Molly was finally becoming more of her old self again, and less the pale ghost she had been for so many months, and if she wanted the family there, the family would be there. Even Bill and Fleur and Charlie had managed. Harry hadn't been social much for the past year beyond his friends and the Weasleys, as a result, it was only when he arrived at the platform at King's Cross with Teddy held protectively in his arms that he realised how much he had changed. Close to a year of researching, planning and throwing himself headfirst into any useful magic he came across had left a very different person than the Harry he had once been. He hadn't grown taller and had long since accepted that he would always be shorter than most, but he had filled out a little, his shoulders were broader, and he let his magic stretch its wings freely these days. He didn't care much for the intimidation factor, but he had learned that it was a useful way to improve his ability to focus for prolonged periods of time, and that was all he cared about. Teddy seemed to like it, Hermione encouraged it, Andromeda understood, and the Weasleys seemed to mostly ignore it. There weren't too many other people out there whose opinion Harry cared about these days. Harry was spotted almost immediately when he arrived on the platform. Then the whispers started. Harry brought up more of his magic, ready to cast a shield in an instant, and the closest of the crowds backed away, cowed by the pressure bearing down on them. Teddy made a small sound and gripped at Harry's robe. He wasn't much for strangers at the moment, and that made the gossiping crowds unforgivable as far as Harry was concerned. Andromeda had seen her grandson's reaction too, and pursed her lips. Harry didn't doubt that only sheer willpower kept her from an acerbic comment about the upbringing of the common witch and wizard. As it was, her displeased expression was enough to make people keep at least a bit of a distance to their small group. Andromeda might have married a Tonks, but she was of black blood and bore enough of a family resemblance to Bellatrix Lestrange that most people were smart enough not to push their luck. Between the two of them, nobody would get near Teddy Lupin, who didn't have a bloody good reason to. A cluster of red hair further on told them where to go. Bless the Weasley and pre-wet lines, and Molly Weasley's perpetually worried expression eased at the sight of them. 
She hugged them tightly when they reached her. Harry was pretty sure it wasn't just his imagination that the hug was tighter than it usually was when they visited. He clearly wasn't the only one a little unnerved at being outside among so many people. Teddy's grip on Harry's robe eased slightly at the sight of another somewhat familiar person, and Harry shifted his grip a little. Teddy was getting heavy, but he was not about to let his godson walk on his own in a crowd like this. Molly got her first good look at Teddy's current looks, and her breath hitched just a little. His hair was black for the moment, from Harry, from Andromeda's father, and genetically from Tonks as well, according to Andromeda, but his eyes had changed during the day from mimicking Ron's warm blue colour to the bright green of Harry's instead. Teddy's features were more black than Potter, but he still looked like Harry's son by blood. Such a handsome young man, Molly said softly. Teddy, feeling the scrutiny, hid his face against Harry's neck, drawing a wry smile from his godfather. He's a little shy right now. Harry didn't glance at the crowds as he said it, but he didn't have to. Molly turned to the closest people with a disapproving frown, and several of them shuffled back a little, destroying the ruse that they weren't paying close attention to their group. Andromeda gave them a disdainful look to match Molly's, then pointedly ignored them. Harry kept an eye on everything, and he knew Ron and Hermione did as well. Fleur looked radiant as ever, but the tension in her body showed that she was probably as uncomfortable there as Harry himself was. Bill certainly didn't look very happy. George was a given. He was only there for his family's sake and would much rather have buried himself in work. When Voldemort had died, Harry had allowed himself a bit of hope that things would eventually return to normal, that there would be Quidditch and dinners and family and plain boring life. A year on had taught him that they were all veterans of a war they'd had no choice but to fight in and no training to rely on, and they would all pay the price for a long time. Most of them had a shield ready to cast a moment's notice. Harry was just the only one of them who was obvious about it. The distant sound of a familiar steam locomotive brought a hush through the crowds. Then the equally familiar sound of the whistle pierced the air and excited voices picked up again. It had been several long months since the students had last been home and that break had taken place under the shadow of a goblin rebellion. Harry didn't blame them for wanting their children home again. Let me hold him, Hermione said quietly, more for the other's benefit than Harry's. She knew he wanted his wand hand free, especially with the Hogwarts Express arriving with an influx of students, and she worked smoothly to make sure only she and Ron would be aware of his unease with being essentially defenceless with a child in his arms. Harry glanced at his godson and Andromeda and then nodded and transferred the toddler to Hermione's arms instead. Harry stroked his hair fondly. Be good for your Aunt Hermione. Teddy grinned widely, showing off his first few teeth, and latched onto her with all the stubborn determination of a fourteen-month-old. He was still a long way from being able to pronounce her name, for now his vocabulary consisted mostly of Mama, a name that Andromeda had readily accepted, despite the pain it had to cause her. But he knew her had played with her frequently and felt perfectly safe with her. Teddy was a quiet child, but he was happy and Harry hoped that was all right. He knew little about children and he still worried that there would be something horribly wrong with Teddy one day and he wouldn't discover it until it was too late. Up ahead, the Hogwarts Express arrived in a cloud of scarlet lines and billowing steam and came to a stop with a relieved sigh. The doors opened, and the first of the students spilled out of the doors in a chaotic mess of robes and luggage and noise. There was shouting and talking and laughter, the sounds of footsteps and running and trunks against stone, and the motion of a thousand or more people in one location. Hermione's grip on Teddy tightened, and Ron drew closer to both of them, and Harry wondered if there would ever be a time again when he saw a crowd like that and did not instinctively look for threats. The younger students seemed to be the first ones out, all of them unfamiliar to Harry. Then the older students appeared at a more relaxed pace, talking to friends and making plans for summer before they split up to find their families.
Bright red caught Harry's eyes. No Weasley would ever be overlooked in a crowd, and Ginny made her way through the thick crowd to the cluster of them, waiting by the wall where there were slightly fewer people. A stuffed vulture bobbed above the crowds further down the platform and was gone again. It looked familiar enough that Harry suspected it was Augusta Longbottoms, which meant Neville was probably over there somewhere, too. Not for the first time he cursed his lack of height, but the complaints by now were half-hearted at best, used to it as he was. There were glimpses of other faces he recognised, students and former students and people who had fought at Hogwarts, but they remained glimpses and were gone again a second or two later. With one last push through a cluster of people, Ginny appeared and ran the last few steps to her mother, trunk forgotten behind her. Luna, a little more meandering, came into view a moment later. Molly hugged her daughter tightly, let go for a second to get a good look at her, then hugged her once more. Ginny bore it with the patience of someone used to it. Then Molly let go of her and wiped her suspiciously wet eyes before she turned to look at Luna. Luna seemed to hesitate for a moment, unsure of what to do, until Molly pulled her close and hugged her tightly as well. "'You poor dear!' Harry just barely heard over the noise of the platforms. "'We have a room for you, and it's yours for as long as you need it.' Some of the tension in Harry eased just a little, so lightly that he had not even been aware of it until then. Luna would be all right. He had known, of course, but it was different to actually see it. There would be people who cared and a roof over her head, and she wouldn't need to marry someone twice her age in return. Luna's huge eyes seemed as suspiciously wet as Molly's when they parted again. Thank you, Mrs. Weasley. Molly, Molly, Luna conceded softly, and Molly gave her a warm smile. The sudden feeling of relief and hope from Ron was almost overwhelming, but both Harry and Hermione politely ignored it. They both understood, and every little bit of progress was one step closer to the Molly Weasley she had once been. In the time it had taken to find each other, the Hogwarts Express had emptied and the billowing clouds of steam eased a little. The first families had left already, by flu or the King's Cross entry, and Harry was slowly starting to look for an excuse to nudge his family and friends to do the same. Teddy was starting to look uncomfortable, and it would be a relief for him and Harry both to get back home again. The twin sounds of apparition, so close together they could be mistaken for one, should not have been audible above the cacophony. The arrival, while extremely rude, one did not apparate into the middle of such crowds, there were designated apparition points for that, should not have been enough to make a stable, well-adjusted person even flinch. Harry had cast a shield before he could consciously decide to hair-trigger paranoia reacting before reason could. Ron and Hermione followed before he could even finish the motion. Bill turned, a question on his lips. And further down the platform, the steam flared terrifying familiar green. Someone screamed, and the mass of people started to move in blind panic. Harry saw flashes of colour, something that could have been shields, for all the good that would do against the killing curse, and plenty of other things that felt like curses on a level Harry could not explain. Bill and Fleur seemed to move as one, pushing the closest of the family up again the wall, clear of the panicking crowds, and Harry felt more than saw Ron and Hermione do the same to protect Andromeda and Teddy. Green again, closer this time. Harry could see nothing, had only the two sounds of apparition to go by, and the crowds were too heavy and panicked to leave any chance of seeing what happened further down the platform. Cold fury settled in Harry, as much from the sheer cowardice of the wizarding world as the instant threat against his family. I'll hold the shield, Ron said, and the circle of his magic expanded outwards and strengthened even as Harry released his. It would do nothing against unforgivables, but it would keep them from being trampled. Their only warning was the first syllable of the killing curse, clear even through the screams. The crowd, seeming to instinctively understand the danger, scattered and fled, leaving a clear shot in their wake. Hermione reacted instantly. Munimenis! 
the platform around them shattered in a perfect circle, following the outer curve of Ron's shield. Rabastan Lestrange's killing curse impacted the wall of rubble a heartbeat later, right where Teddy and Hermione would have been. Harry was already retaliating, having moved outside the shield the moment he felt Hermione's intent. He caught a brief glimpse of Teddy's raw terror before the rubble wall went up, and he used that anger to fuel his magic. George appeared from behind, bills, fleurs, shield already casting, joining Harry's string of non-verbal spells. They both stuck to legal ones, if barely. There were too many witnesses around to risk anything else. Harry's mind blocked out the screams and the near misses, not even bothering to shield against most of it. He trusted magic and instincts to keep him safe, and threw himself head first into the fight instead. A flicker of sickly yellow was all the warning he got before Rodolphus Lestrange joined the chaos. Harry met the spell with a hailstorm of rubble and knew he'd got it right when he saw the stone and concrete dissolve into black ash. Then George was retaliating, letting Harry focus on Rabastan. The spells came increasingly fast, Harry's fury matching Lestrange's viciousness blow by blow. The air between them, heavily charged by magic, became wobbly and molten before Harry's eyes as the spells came swift and brutal, the next cast before the first could hit. Harry spotted the first weakness in Lestrange's defence, dodged a purple spell by a hair's breadth and cast the strongest cutting curse he could. It punched straight through Lestrange's hastily cast shield, and only the man's quick reflexes meant it hit his arm rather than the centre of his chest, his wand arm. Rodolphus Lestrange realised it at the same time Harry did. George forgotten Rodolphus cast a killing curse at Harry and forced him to retreat. Seconds of delay at the most, but enough for the Lestrange brothers. Rodolphus shielded his brother. Harry, recognising an escape when he saw it, made a split-second decision. A wordless summoning charm tore Rabastan Lestrange's ruined sleeve clear from his robe and into Harry's hand. The moment later, the two Death Eaters vanished simultaneously by apparition. For a moment it was utterly silent. Nothing on the platform moved. Then Harry pressed the bloody sleeve into George's hand. Keep this under stasis. We'll need it to track them. He spoke urgently and quietly before anyone could approach and discover what they were doing. Then check on Teddy. Use that as cover. Go. George nodded once and vanished in the sharp crack of disapparition. Then time seemed to start again and the wrecked platform came back to life in a cacophony of sound as the aftermath of the battle took over. To one side, Harry spotted the crimson robes of the auras, conveniently late as usual. Two of them split away from the others and headed in Harry's direction, and he dug deep for what little patience he had left as he mentally prepared himself for several hours of questioning. Teddy was safe. His friends, his family, they were all safe. That was all that mattered. It was five hours later and well into the evening before Harry could leave the Ministry. The Aurors had brought him back as a witness and proceeded to question him thoroughly on what happened over and over as if they were looking for inconsistencies. Harry didn't know why they bothered. They clearly weren't doing much to capture the rogue Death Eaters anyway, so any information they got wouldn't be used anyway. He had been in contact with Hermione and Ron the entire time, letting them know everything that happened and passing it on to George. None of the Aurors seemed interested in bringing any of the others in for questioning, at least. Harry had explained that he had sent George off to check on Teddy, as he assumed he would not be able to himself for a good while, and nothing was closer to his heart than his godson's safety. A quick check with Andromeda Tonks revealed an angry, sharp-tongued witch demanding to know exactly why they were keeping her grandson's godfather away and George Weasley scowling behind her with a crying teddy in his arms. They had ended that line of questioning rather fast. Eventually they let him go, because he had done nothing but defend himself, and they couldn't justify making him repeat the same explanation over and over for any longer than they already had. Harry apparated the moment he was clear of the wards. He was met at Grimold Place by Hermione, Ron and George. Teddy, he asked as the first thing, Upset but safe, Hermione said immediately. We're all safe. 
Harry nodded and felt the tension drain from his body. What's the damage? Eight dead and about two dozen in St. Mungo's, from what I heard, Ron reported. Won't know until the prophet comes out tomorrow, with the official statement, though. Harry nodded again. He could find out the details tomorrow. The people he cared about were safe. That was what mattered. He glanced questioningly at George and received a nod in return. Then he looked at Ron and Hermione. You should go out tomorrow. Spend some time with Ginny and the others. Reassure your mum that you're safe. Harry! Whatever Hermione was about to say was cut off when Ron interrupted. We will! Hermione stared hard at them. Then she nodded once. All right, just be careful. Ron, I'm going to bed, she told him pointedly, giving Harry no chance to answer. Ron, look at her retreating back, then at Harry, then back again. Good luck, he finally said, and vanished with her upstairs. George glanced at him. The shop tomorrow? I'll be there. George smiled. It was not a nice expression. The back office in Weasley's Wizard Wheezes contained several heavily warded boxes. Having seen the magic put into those protections, Harry could safely say that their records and trade secrets were probably better protected than just about anything in the alley, save for Gringotts. The best protected one was embedded in the floor and protected by a Fidelius cast by Harry, with George himself as the secret keeper. This was the one that George opened to bring out the bloodied sleeve, kept safe in a glass jar under a stasis charm. Nice little souvenir, George mused. Shame his arm survived. You sure this is enough to find them? The blood was as fresh as it had been the day before, glistening against the dull black of the Death Eater robes. There was plenty of it, and it was more than recent enough to work. Harry really didn't want to do it but his own distaste of the spell he was about to cast was more than outweighed by the knowledge of the threat they posed to Teddy. It should be. He hadn't spent a lot of time on the dark magic that dealt with blood. Most of the spells were disgusting at best and required a lot of preparation, but a few he had remembered. One of the most simple tracking spells was one of them. I don't know how long we'll have. Somewhere between a few hours and a few days before the trace disappears. Probably closer to hours than days in this case. If Harry had the ability to keep his own magic from attacking the foreign blood, or if they'd had more blood to use, it would have been longer. As it was, they would be lucky to get a day. Ready? All packed for a little hunting expedition. Harry didn't ask exactly what sort of things George had felt would be useful to pack. If he needed to know, he would find out. Weasley's Wizard Wheezes had a number of products that never saw their way to the shelves. They were both ready, and he had run out of reasons to stall. Harry transfigured a small glass, then opened the lid of the jar and pulled on the blood with his magic. There were no words, just will, and the blood was slowly wrung from the fabric in thin strands like parasites, reluctant to let go. With the cloth wrung dry, Harry guided the blood to the glass. He murmured the tracking spell under his breath, more sound and magic than actual words, then picked up the glass and raised it at George. Cheers, he said, and downed it before he could change his mind. The taste was thick and metallic and disgusting, but it had nothing on the flood of foreign magic that followed, highly hostile and extremely incompatible foreign magic. Harry gagged, but the spell kept him from vomiting up the blood. Instead, he dry-heaved until his throat felt raw and his lungs burned, and then finally, mercifully, the feeling let up. George pushed another glass into his hand. Harry glanced at it for just long enough to identify it as plain water. Then he downed it gratefully. Thanks, he managed hoarsely. George grimaced. Better you than me. When you said tracking spell, I thought you meant something you cast with a bloody wand. This will find them through anything. It gives me a direction to follow. With his coughing fit over, Harry could already feel it, a strand of uncomfortable, nagging magic pulling in a northerly direction. It won't get us through a ward or a Fidelius, but we'll know exactly where they are, even if we can't see the building. It'll get us as close as possible. What way? George was all business, well aware that they were on a countdown now. North, a little to the west, maybe, I can't tell yet. I'll get the brooms. 
They followed the trace to a small old manor, a good bit outside of Leicester. It was not a particularly nice flight, but neither of them cared. It was the fastest way to follow their prey, and an uncomfortable broom ride was the least of the issues they would face. The muggle-repelling ward stretched out well beyond the nearby land and kept the entire area wizarding property, and the manor itself was even better protected than Harry had expected. The far more solid defensive wards surrounded the manor alone, prioritising strength over range, and while they seemed more like a temporary measure, they were still strong. Very strong. A temporary hideout, but very well protected one. Between the two of them, it took little time to raise their own wards to keep their prey from fleeing. Harry's tracking spell showed that at least Rabastan hadn't tried to flee, though whether it was because Harry and George hadn't been spotted or because the two Death Eaters planned to fight their way out was anyone's guess. Only two life forms showed up when they cast a detection spell, so at least they weren't facing an army. So, your lordship? George mused as they stared at the hideout's defensive wards from a safe distance. Any ideas? Harry thought about it. Neither of them were good enough to take down the wards without alerting the people inside, but then... They probably know we're here by now. Probably, George agreed. In their place, I'd wait with an attack until they're sure we're onto them. We might not know whether they're even there. Sure, we set up our own wards, but that's just a sensible precaution if we're planning an attack for when they return. Harry couldn't take down the wards silently, but when he didn't have to worry about being stealthy. That opened up a wealth of opportunities, especially with comparatively temporary wards like these. Harry went through the options and easily settled on one. They had attacked his godson, had targeted a one-year-old child, and that Teddy was now around the same age that Harry himself had been orphaned at did not help in the least, and Harry was not particularly inclined to play nice. He breathed a word, and Fiendfire flared to life in a roar of destruction. The first time he had cast it had been a battle for control. Command of the living, treacherous magic came far easier now. Fiendfire would never stop fighting, would always try to turn on its wielder, but Harry didn't mind. He spread his arms and the wall of flame parted. Two massive pillars rose and twisted and turned into twin basilisks as Harry watched. One turned and roared at Harry, then turned back to the house as the pressure of will forced it to obey. Harry turned his palms upwards and the two creatures rose higher, entwined so tightly that they looked more the part of a two-headed monstrosity than common basilisks. The fire strengthened and more animals appeared at the base a monstrous bird that was crushed against the ground before it could even take off towards George, a dragon that spread enormous white-hot wings and took flight towards the manor. And only then did Harry let the twin basilisks fall. The entwined beasts hit the defensive wards almost dead center and explored in an inferno of smaller creatures. The wards lit up in a multitude of color as they fought against the onslaught. Then, with a triumphant roar, the dragon struck and the wards trembled and collapsed. The shockwave tore apart the dragon and the smaller remnants of the basilisks before it faded and reached Harry and George as only a whisper of magic. The last surviving bit of fiendfire fought viciously against Harry's command before it yielded and vanished with one last bright flare. Harry breathed in the familiar smell of wood and soil incinerated to less than ashes, and underneath it the less familiar smell of ozone that lingered from two powerful forces of magic colliding in a battle to the death. Bloody hell, George breathed. If they didn't already knew we were here, they'd know for sure now. Harry smiled and his eyes glowed with the last embers of fiend fire. He could feel the magic against his own, but he let it and embraced the last whispers of raw power that still lingered. It took care of the wards. Right, George's smile twisted. My turn, Ickle Harry. He brought out a fist full of delicate-looking marbles with a swirling grey and black mass inside. We were working on something called Nightmare Nibbles. We had Daydream's charms already, you see. 
We wanted something for the prankster that wanted something a little more vicious. A delicious bite of nougat and chocolate with an aftertaste of your most embarrassing nightmares. Just a taste, though. The potion turned out entirely too strong and volatile, so we saved it for other purposes. As he spoke, the marbles expanded to the size of the glass ornaments Harry had seen on the Hogwarts Christmas tree and floated in the air before them. At their full size, the swirls of grey and black had turned into a roiling, ominous-looking mass within each globe, and the fist full of marbles had become fifteen full-size spheres. If they were smart, they would have attacked us by now. But they're Death Eaters and cowards, the lot of them, and they prefer to stay in their little hidey-holes until you force them out. George had snarled the last part, and no sooner had he finished before the spheres shot towards the manor with the force of a bludger. Three hit the windows and did no damage. Someone had been smart enough to spell them unbreakable, and all that happened was that the glass spheres broke against them. The walls had obviously not received the same treatment as the remaining spheres punched their way through solid stone and inside the house. I reinforced them, of course. Wouldn't do any good if they break at the wrong time, George said conversationally. Would you look at that? The shattered spheres outside had fallen to the ground, but the fumes they had contained had no intentions of staying there. The roiling mass started to expand into thick, grey and black clouds that sought out every crack and hole in the walls like a living thing. When it found one, the smoke flowed inside, while the rest spread around the house like impossibly thick smoke. Harry only just managed to see the light behind the windows turn dark grey from the sheer amount of smoke from the other spheres inside. Then the clouds closed completely around it. There were flickers of colours, red, yellowish, horrifying familiar green, and the sound of stone being blasted to bits. Then the scream started. Like I said, far too strong and volatile, George said. He sounded vicious and cheerful at the same time. There's a cauldron's worth in those marbles, a lifetime worth of nightmares. He raised his wand and a brisk wind picked up. The churning clouds seemed to resist for a moment, then simply fell apart and were blown aside. George waited until the air was clear and bright again. Only then did he allow the wind to die down. The manor had a number of holes in the walls from the spheres and several far larger chunks missing where Harry assumed the spells cast from the inside had hit. A gaping hole in one corner splintered rock where a window should have been. It had left enough of the building exposed that even the smoke inside was gone. The screaming had not stopped. Bloody hell, Harry whispered, echoing George's words. George's smile was all sharp teeth. We were proud of that invention. Couldn't sell it, of course, but it has other uses. After you, your lordship. Together, they crossed the last distance to the manor. Harry had a shield spell ready, but nothing greeted them beyond increasingly hoarse screams. The room beyond the door was dusty and empty, and the wallpaper draped from the top of the walls. Harry's tracking spell led straight ahead, but the screams, now clearly distinctive as two voices, came from two different directions. Harry gestured towards the room that his spell pulled him towards. George nodded and gestured towards the left where the second voice originated. He should probably have been more cautious stepping into the room. A shield charm wouldn't protect against a killing curse, and he had no idea where in the room his target was. But the screams were too terrified to be a trap. The sight that greeted him reminded him just what kind of ruthlessness the twins had kept hidden underneath a cover of harmless pranks. Rabastan Lestrange was curled up on the floor in his black Death Eater robes, his eyes wide open and unfocused as he screamed at something only he could see. His wand was held in a death grip so tight that Harry was surprised it hadn't snapped. It was no wonder the spells from the manor had stopped as the full effect of the potion fumes had hit. Harry silenced him with a spell. Only then did he notice that the other screaming voice had been cut off too, plunging the building into sudden unnerving silence. Lestrange screamed soundlessly and clawed at the floor with his empty hand. Harry's expression twisted into a snarl. Expelliarmus! 
Like Fiendfire, the disarming spell was one of those spells that adapted to the power put into it. As a result, Harry's venomous command tore the wand out of Lestrange's grip with enough force to tear the skin from his fingers with it and send his body into the wall with the sharp crack of broken bones. A silent pair of spells followed and left a stunned and restrained prisoner in their wake. A flick of his wand and Harry floated his Death Eater cargo behind him. He found George in the next room, standing over an equally disarmed and restrained Rodolphus Lestrange, restrained and utterly hairless. He glanced at George, and the man smiled sharply. A little spell to get his attention. It rips out the victim's hair, all of it. It's missing a numbing component, too. Can't imagine what someone was thinking, inventing a spell like that. Maybe they had special cases like Roddy here in mind. It certainly worked. George said. Right beautifully at that. Grim old place with these two. A cell for each of them. Harry cast several detection spells on the two Death Eaters and the house both, but got nothing back. The building was silent and bore plenty of evidence of having only recently been taken back into use. A few more spells took care of any magical evidence from the fight, just in case the muggle-repelling ward should fail before the traces had faded. The rest of the damage didn't matter much to Harry. They found two massive chests in one room, a mix of medical supplies, clothes, food and gold, plenty for the Lestranges to have hid out in the small manor for months. The chests were bulky and hard to shrink with the touchier potions among the medical supplies, but were perfectly suitable for a feather-light charm. There's nothing else here. Harry finally said, when George had sent the chests ahead by port key, we'll get the rest out of them with Veritaserum. They grabbed a prisoner each and vanished with a sharp crack, leaving the old building empty and abandoned once more. Unlike Blishwick and a number of other low-level Death Eaters, Harry did not doubt that the Lestranges had learned some measure of defence against Veritaserum. The easiest way to get around that was to dose them while they were still unconscious. They started with Rodolphus Lestrange and a list of questions four pages long. Unlike Blishwick, there was little doubt about the fact that he was guilty as hell. It was simply a matter of how much he had done and how much additional information they could get from him. Even with the Veritaserum administered with the man unconscious, Lestrange still seemed to have some degree of defence. He was significantly less talkative than Blishwick, even with every sign he was completely under the potion, and getting complex answers from him was all but impossible. They would ask him to list other Death Eaters, and he would mention one and stop until they prompted him for more. They would ask him to list his crimes, and they would have to specify under which version of the Ministry laws and keep prompting for more answers. Even though it was a bloody headache, Harry was still reluctantly impressed. It was another way to get around at least part of an interrogation, and he would have to remember it for the next time it was his turn under the potion again. It took four solid hours before they finally seemed to have pulled as much from his reluctant mind as they could. They both knew there was significantly more hidden away that would be extremely useful to know. Some things they didn't know the right questions for. Some things were simply too complex for Lestrange's particular brand of Veritaserum resistance. There were ways around that, though, and Harry's reluctance to suggest it came only from the fact that he was genuinely not bothered by those curses anymore, rather than any moral objections to the idea. The Imperius, then? George gave the Death Eater a disgusted look. He's probably got some way to fight that too. He's a Lestrange. Not like Voldemort would need to put him under it to get him to follow along like a deranged puppy, so it would be in his best interest that Roddy here wouldn't obey someone else. Harry swallowed. His heartbeat kicked up a notch, anxiety and unwanted anticipation settling into vague elation, and he knew, even as he spoke, that if George ever drew a line before Harry did, now would be it. There are ways around that. Harry said quietly, his pulse fluttered like hummingbird wings. Voldemort's imperious was merciless. It wasn't just his will alone. The after-effects of the Cruciatus made it a lot harder to resist. It would have been so easy to fall into that blissful, painless state. George's breath sounded like a drawn-out hiss. Would it work? They're used to Voldemort's Crucios. Harry's lips twisted into an unpleasant smile. Not for more than a year. 
I can't match Voldemort's skill with it, but I don't think we need to. George was silent as seconds ticked on. Whatever he was thinking, it didn't show on his face, and Harry simply waited for his friend and partner in crime to make a decision. Killing an unarmed Death Eater had been one thing, but somehow the Unforgivables felt different, and Harry understood. Casting them in the heat of battle was very different to the cold, calculated approach Harry had suggested. Then George nodded slowly, eyes never leaving Lestrange. The potion had worn off and the man stunned again, but didn't mean he was harmless. Renovate, Crucio Imperio, then. I'll leave the last two to you. Ready? Harry nodded. Renovate! George snapped, and the man on the floor groaned. Lestrange shifted, eyes still pressed tightly together. He probably had a pounding headache. Veritaserum could do that sometimes. And then Harry raised his wand, and the world seemed to still. He remembered Teddy's wide-eyed terror, the screams and the smell of blood and smoke, and beyond that, the horrors of the Battle of Hogwarts. He remembered Hedwig's death and Sirius falling through the veil and the Department of Mysteries, and he grasped every last bit of hate and desperate fanatic need for revenge. Then he focused on Lestrange, and the world sped up once more. Crucio. It was more a hiss than a word, so low it could almost have been mistaken for parcel tongue, and Lestrange screamed. Magic sang to him, bright and vivid and impossibly light. Every sound from Lestrange was a delight, every note of hoarse scream a wonder, and then Harry ruthlessly pushed it aside and stopped the curse. His world plunged into darkness, his magic, bright and warm a moment ago, felt lost and freezing. George had not moved. Harry looked dispassionately at Lestrange, faintly, irrationally annoyed that the elation of the Cruciatus was gone, and then he snapped the second curse. Imperio! This time it was a command, sharp and merciless, and his will bore down on Lestrange's. The man fought hard, even disoriented, and wrecked by Cruciatus after effects as he was, but for all that he had experience and age on his side, Harry had raw power and relentless will. They were frozen for an instant, perfectly matched, and then Lestrange's defences utterly crumbled. The Imperius was a low, warm, pleased murmur to the bright, vivid wonder of the Cruciatus, but the magic was every bit as insidiously pleasant. "'Tell me about your safe houses, Rodolphus,' Harry said almost gently, and forced the order into the very foundations of his will with nothing more than a thought. And Rodolphus spoke. It approached the early hours of the morning before they finished with Rodolphus and Rabastan both. The Veritaserum Cruciatus Imperius combination had proved extremely useful, and left them with pages and pages of information to go through. The Lestranges had been careful people. They'd had to be, to avoid the auras for so long. Among the many pages there was information about two small, heavily warded safe houses, hidden funds, lists of contacts, allies, sympathisers, mercenaries, and it made every last unforgivable worth it. Blishwick had been all but useless, just one more bit of cannon fodder among Voldemort's forces. The inner circle, though, the Lestranges, had been a gold mine. Both Harry and George were running on invigoration drafts. There would be time to crash later. The Lestrange brothers, both stunned and restrained, had been left on the floor. George gave them a disgusted look. Finish with a couple of cutting curses, then get rid of the bodies. Reckon we've got everything we can out of them. Harry froze. The memories were still raw and all too detailed. The screams, Hermione's shield, Teddy's raw terror. No, no, he repeated a little stronger when George gave him a surprised look. Not after what they did. Without proof, people will still think they're out there, even a decade down the line. They need to be publicly, visibly dead. He couldn't tell Andromeda or the Weasleys that the Lestranges were dead and not expect questions. And he wasn't going to let Teddy grow up with even the slightest bit of fear that the widower and brother-in-law of his deranged Aunt Bellatrix would show up one day and finish what they had started in King's Cross. We'll have to get rid of any evidence, George finally said. It wasn't an objection. Port key them to the atrium in the Ministry of Magic, maybe. They've got a spot left unwarded for port key travel. 
less traumatizing than Diagon. There might be kids around. Harry nodded, but his focus was still on the two unmoving figures. Harry? They shot a killing curse at my godson. And there it was, the last motivation he needed. Not the hatred of the Cruciatus or the raw will of the Imperius, but the merciless desire to see someone dead. A cutting curse would do the job just as well, but that wasn't the point anymore. The cutting curse had other uses. The killing curse did not. And in that moment, Harry wanted nothing more than to see the Lestranges dead from the same curse they had cast around so freely themselves. And he wanted it badly enough that it made his magic burn. George took a sharp breath and stepped back, and Harry brought up his wand. Avada Kedavra! Bright poison green lit the room and his magic soared. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description. Or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.